Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the New America Foundation. This is the launch of a year-long project called the Energy Trap, which has been looking at how middle-class families pay for gasoline. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to, for the support of the New America Foundation. This project was funded um, by the Rockefeller Foundation. And um, we have kind of a, a very exciting discussion today about the role of gas prices in energy policy. And um, I'm going to kick off by sort of talking about some of the things that we found through the energy trap. Um, I want to remind you of, of what's happening today. Uh, C-SPAN is in the room, and we're also videoing this for um, New America's website. So uh, there's a couple of things to remember about that. First of all, everything you say is on the record. Everything you, every sneeze is on the record, too. Um, and when you have a question, please wait for the microphone. We'll hand you the microphone, and that way you'll be clear on all of the audio. Um, the speakers that we have today are um, John Skip Leitner from uh, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Uh, he has done a, an economic survey for the energy trap on the um, consumer's response to gasoline prices since 1970. It's a very interesting, very detailed report. He'll be going second. And then our respondent today is um, Jared Bernstein, who's with the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, he also was um, the chief economist for the middle class task force uh, done by the White House. And we're just very delighted to have him here um, people who talk about energy and environmental issues, um, they tend to sort of stay in that silo, and we're very excited to sort of cross-pollinate um, cross with people working on income issues, and we're looking forward to, to working more with um, people on, on assets or credit issues in the future because energy is such a cross-cutting um, issue. So thank you very much for coming, and I'm going to um, start the show now. So, you know, the energy trap grew out of a lot of anecdotes. Um, I ran across, I, I've been studying gasoline for years, and um, I ran across people um, who kept talking about how much they were spending, and particularly in rural areas. And at first, the quantities of money that they were spending on their commute, when you added the gasoline to the cost of their car, um, or listened to the story of how far they had to go for two jobs, they were kind of jaw-dropping, and in fact, oftentimes I do the math a couple of times. What we tried to do with the energy trap was to understand who those people are and where they fit into the big sort of tapestry of American fuel use. And, and we tried to move from the anecdote towards, um, towards real data to understand how deep this was, how pervasive this is, and, um, and to understand what it means to be sort of trapped into paying increasing amounts for gasoline and what that feels like, particularly at the lower end of the middle class. Um, so we have uh, the study by Skip, and uh, we also had another study done um, which looked at the uh, behavior of 2,000 households. It was uh, a very elaborate survey, and we're actually not finished with tabulating all the data. So what we have in here is some preliminary results which offer some food for thought. So I'm just going to play you one of these anecdotes so that you understand kind of what we're talking about. This is a guy named Darren Flanoy. He is a... Um, Um, he's a security guard in, uh, in California. He has a very long commute. I'm going to play it for you now. My name is Darren Flanoy. I do security work. And I work seven days a week. My commute time is uh, 560 miles. I spend about $500 a month on gas. My car payment, I spend $515 a month. Car insurance, I spend $80 a month. Car tolls, I spend uh, $180 a month. Total expenses, $1,275 a month. Oh, we're getting squeezed off. Gas prices, <laughs> it just, 
middle class is going through tough times right now. If gasoline goes up five dollars, I have to pay it. Okay. Um, I wanted to show you that video so that you can sort of see this, what the energy trap looks like in action. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about Darren's case is that he didn't do anything exceptional. He had a very well-paying security job in 2004. He had a lot, he made a lot on overtime. His salary was over $50,000 a year. For years, for 20 years he's been working, he really wanted to buy a house. Um, he bought a condo that was much further from his job. Um, and then he began to commute to there in 2006. In 2007, he traded in his car that had 200,000 miles on it because there was a rebate on uh, an SUV. And the rebate was a $6,000 rebate. Now, gas prices were going up at the time. The rebates were designed to offset the Im increasing price of gasoline. Um, and, and allow consumers to, to sort of consider the rebate in the context of the car and assume that they weren't going to be hit that badly by gas prices. So he bought it. Actually, two days after he got it, he tried to take it back, but they'd already sold his old car, and so he was kind of locked into this. Um, but that is not particularly exceptional. In 2008, he lost that security job um, because of the recession, uh, and he was rehired in two separate part-time jobs. So that's why he now works seven days a week. And that's actually a very common story in, in terms of replacing full-time jobs with part-time jobs, uh, sometimes one part-time job, sometimes multiples. Um, we have people commuting uh, really extraordinary uh, amounts of time for very limited jobs. Uh, another person who we interviewed in here in Montana was commuting um, 60, uh, so she's commuting six hours a week for 12 hours worth of job. That gives you a sense of the, in, in Montana, that gives you a sense of the sacrifices that people are willing to put up with to keep these jobs. Um, no. Sorry. Um, what I want to show you is what this, the change in gas prices looks like across the country. So this is on a, uh, this map shows on a household by household basis what uh, the range that people were paying for gas in 2010. When gas prices went up in 2011, um, this is where the household, the average household cost of gas went to. We have a lot of, t of uh, states over $400 um, for household monthly cost of gasoline. In Texas, that meant an increase of $90 a month. In New Mexico, that meant an, in, an increase of $100 a month. This is coming straight out of family budgets to go towards gas. There's really no way to, to plan for this. And on a macro level, this is uh, $100 billion more than last year. So it's equivalent almost exactly to the middle class tax break. It is really uh, regressive and, and moving across the country. Um, Vermont, surprisingly enough, was an extra $148 between 2010 and 2011. Um, you can play with this website later. It's, there's much to play with on here. The, the, the conventional thinking about high gas prices is that when gas prices rise, consumers respond by using less. So Skip is going to talk later about this analysis that he did um, showing that, in fact, since 1970, consumer response to high gas prices has been incredibly flat, really strikingly flat. And in fact, the um, amount of gas that we use seems to rise with income. So we have this tension between, on the one hand, the rising use of gas with income and this kind of static response of consumers to price. This is really striking because so much of our energy policy on the left, the right, the center is all based on price. We believe in putting a, ca a carbon tax in to change behavior. We believe that rising prices will change the way that people spend on cars. There's a lot of um, belief in price. And what it looks like when you look at consumers' inability to respond is that our energy policy is in some ways some kind of bankruptcy policy um, on the household level. And it's something that we really need to deal with. The other thing to remember is that um, the, the rise in, in, in energy use with income 
is a very complex relationship. And Skip will get into this a little bit more. This woman, Laura, who's uh, pictured here in an anecdote, um, commutes 120 miles a day because she wants to maintain her salary. She moved to a rural part of Georgia. She was used to a salary of around $60,000. She could have gotten a job closer that paid less, but she wanted to maintain that salary. Um, and so she's driving 120 miles a day. Her total commute costs are about $17,000, so it absorbs the increase uh, in potential income, but that wasn't actually something she thought much about until we talked. Um, and I, I think that the, we really need to, to think about other interventions in price and changing behavior. The average annual cost of transportation is quite a large and complex number, but um, the, the government estimate is that uh, the cost of a car and fuel together is $7,900 for families of four, um, and making about $50,000. By our estimates, it looks like they're probably spending about more like $10,000, and some of them are probably spending closer to twelve or $13,000. It's a significant chunk of money. The, good news, uh, the bad news about that is like, this is a massive amount of money that's basically your ticket to participate in the economy. A lot of people don't have a choice of riding mass transit or switching out. The good news is, is that that cost has a lot of components. So you can change the car, you can change the financing on the car, and you can increase the mileage of the car. You can, there are a lot of different ways to, um, to change this number and reduce its, the total overall hit that transit takes on a household. Um, and obviously one of the things that would be great, and most families will say they need two cars to have a ticket to work in the economy, is if you could get rid of one of those cars um, you'd free up perhaps five or six thousand dollars that the family could spend on something else, and that really resonates with people when we talk to them. The other thing that's happened over the past couple of years is that the um, s amount of family income that goes towards gas has really risen. This is a the graphics in this. Uh, excuse me, the graphics in this presentation were all done uh, in-house by New America's crew. Troy is sitting in the back and Andy's sitting in the back. Um, this is this incredible uh, view of the, the little circles stand for states and they, when they're blue, uh, they indicate the percentage, a low percentage of family income uh, or median household income from that state that's going into gas. What's striking is how much this has changed. The set point in people's minds is that gas is taking up a small amount of family income. And what happens is after 2003, 2004, this starts to rise really extraordinarily. Um, states like Mississippi and Montana uh, with very, very high uh, transit burdens where people have to drive many more miles a year are um, striking. You see it goes up to red, that's about 19% of median income is going towards um, gasoline in that state. That's just an incredibly high burden and you have to wonder what it's doing to those economies in those areas. And I think one of the things to think about for the energy trap is really focusing geographically on places that are in particularly squeezed by this. I really want to bring to your attention this tiny, tiny blue ball. <laughs> um, that's Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, that is, in Washington, D.C., the amount of transit and also probably the fact that a lot of people buy gas outside the city means that um, in these numbers, uh, the Washington, D.C. is at about 2% of household median income. Um, that's really kind of extraordinary. Um, the other thing about the energy trap is that it particularly affects a certain segment of the middle class. And um, this is information from our survey. Uh, it's basically raw data. It's income segregated from 15 to 20,000 up to 75 to 80,000. Um, the segmentations are a little eccentric. It's part of how the surveying firm actually broke them up. But what I wanted to, want you to look at is the percentage of, of household income that's being spent on gas according to people's self-reporting. Um, but these people in the red area, in particular, are spending a very high percentage. They have a certain other barriers that make their um, spending 
more complex and, and that make them more locked into a spending pattern and unable to change it. One is the miles per gallon of their cars. This is an average, and this is actually not self-reported data. We actually got their, all their cars in the years, and we filled in the data from the EPA on what their actual mileage was. You can see that this crowd has a significantly higher burden. The difference between here and here, which is admittedly somewhat magnified by the way we're displaying it, but it's actually uh, more, than, uh, it's more than $350 a year this year. So it's a significant spread in what that means for family gasoline spending. Um, the people at the low end of the middle class also drive further to their jobs. This is jobs work. Um, and significantly, they also have very high repair bills. So they have much older cars, which puts them really at a lot of economic risk. The other thing here is insurance, um, which is all over the map. Uh, the thing about insurance, someone who I'd interviewed wrote to me yesterday, and I had never actually, uh, I've always been a fan of increasing the price of insurance for how much you drive. And she was saying, look, they're squeezing us again, because obviously if you have to drive further, you're going to be squeezed by, um, by pr the pricing of insurance. Uh, and uh, I think that that kind of reveals how a lot of policies that we design to try to rationalize and make people behave more rationally around income, I mean around uh, gas prices, may in fact uh, be punishing some parts of the, of the community. Um, the other thing to, to recognize is that we have a lot of policies around fuel efficiency um, and we have incentives and uh, we have uh, also mass transit policies. Some of these policies tend to benefit the people at the upper end of the scale. For example, um, tax credits for hybrids and more efficient vehicles. Cash for clunkers in some ways really reached the people who had credit uh, and were able to purchase a new car. Um, mass transit, a recent Brookings study found that more mass transit ended at high-skilled jobs than ended at low-skilled jobs. These are, this is, we really need to sort of focus clearly on the middle class, and in particular the lower middle class, and think about ways to give them choices in their spending. Um, one of the big questions is, why doesn't everybody drive a more fuel-efficient car? Because 10 or 15 years ago, the cheapest cars in the, um, you know, the cheapest cars in the market were the most efficient. I, at one point, had a $1,000 Toyota Corolla that got, you know, 35 miles to the gallon. Well, the, the issue is, is that uh, used car markets now fluctuate with gas prices. And you have this um, wonderful and bizarre situation in which the uh, compact cars, during high, times of high prices, the prices of compact cars are now uh, eclipsing, and this is used cars, are now eclipsing the cost of the midsize and you also have um, SUVs falling in price when prices are high. What this means is, is that if you're strapped for cash and um, you're buying a, a car from a used car dealer, you may find that a very old, this is actually for relatively good condition cars, the, the early stages of the used car market, you may find that the cheapest car for you is the least efficient. And so the, the market incentives are not aligned. The other thing that really blocks people in this market is access to credit uh, that keeps people from uh, in the lower tiers of, of the middle class from choosing exactly which car they want and which car would be most appropriate. Um, this woman, Tammy Trahan, is from New Hampshire. Uh, her story is really interesting. She um, had to buy a, she had gone through a divorce that had basically ruined her credit. She lived 55 miles from a, a pretty good job and she couldn't move her kids out of school. She couldn't move because she couldn't rent a new place because of this credit situation. So she bought this SUV, which seemed appropriate for the New Hampshire winters. It was $9,000. By the time she was done paying for it, seven years later, she'd paid $25,000 for a $9,000 car. So this is a very, um, the interest rates at the lower end of the credit market are just punishing. And she, by the time she was done paying for this used car that she'd been paying for for seven years, it needed tremendous numbers of repairs. It also was using $500 worth of gas a week. And when it finally broke down, well, before it broke down, she was transferring all sorts of funds within the family budget to keep getting to work. The kids dropped out of sports, which has long-term implications uh, in terms of health. She stopped buying uh, her asthma medication, which landed her in the emergency room twice. She changed the way she was buying food. They would oftentimes just eat 
peanut butter or mac and cheese boxes to sort of get through the week so that she got her paycheck and then they had more money. All of this sounds very extreme. She also had three other jobs. This sounds very extreme and it, it, it's actually not that extreme. And the wonderful thing about Tammy's story is she had this horrible final breakdown with the car and she was steered towards a New Hampshire program called More Than Wheels, which got her into a Toyota Yaris with very good fuel mileage and, um, and a, a good 5% loan on that car. And you know her, her whole family has sort of returned to stability. And the kids do not worry that she's not going to be able to come and pick them up because the car is too broken to go. Um, I think one of the things about when we talk about gas prices, when we just talk about gas prices, we tend to lose leave out a lot of the existential effects that this has on families. This is very, very demoralizing. And you know, the sort of revolution in Tammy's life and in her control of her finances when she just, a Yaris, for heaven's sakes, a Yaris with a decent rate of interest. Um, it really shows how you could target programs at people who are really in distress. Um, I think one of the things we tend to believe um, and take as a given that Americans are very, very attached to their cars and they don't want anyone messing up that relationship. We asked people in our survey how they felt about their cars. What was striking is when they talked about what they disliked about their cars, um, it really wasn't about the cars, it was about all the costs that they were tied to. And uh, in this, this graph, they, uh, they also, they took every opportunity to vent about how frustrated they were with the state of the economy, the state of jobs, their, the, uh, their dependence upon gasoline, their inability to choose. This combination of sort of helplessness and anger and frustration was something that they really wanted to get out, which is, you know, when you're looking through 2,000 written responses and sort of scanning them, it's striking to see necessary evil so many more times than freedom uh, when people are talking about cars. And I think what this indicates um, and, and our interviews also indicate is that people are ready for a bit of a change uh, and they want to be able to spend the inc their income the way they want to spend it and they're starting to see cars as something that uh, a sort of a sponge that absorbs an enormous amount of their income. That doesn't mean they're going to give up their cars. <laughs> so we should stop thinking that way. What it does mean is that people might be willing to make some lifestyle choices if they were really convenient for them. And there's a really interesting project in California. There's an office park uh, in San Ramon that is uh, quite far from public transit. So they started a very aggressive transit program. So this is, would be an employer-centered transit program. They have a woman who's kind of evangelical. Her name is Marcy. And she's very concerned with getting people to leave their cars at home and take transit. So they've arranged, of course, all the transit schedules and the stop, bus stops so that they land at the job. They give people rides in taxis home if they need it after they've, if a carpool situation doesn't work out. They've gotten 30% of their workers to leave their cars at home, which is 10,000 people. It's a tremendous number of cars off the road. And um, the reason that people do it is that they enjoy the lifestyle change. After the first couple weeks of stressfully taking transit, it starts to become something that they do, some time that they have to reflect. They combine it with exercise so that they spend less time on the treadmill. It's a very different way of thinking about transit than thinking we need more lines. Um, this is more of figuring out how it really fits into people's sense of who they are. The last thing I want to show you is um, people's feelings about what makes for a reasonable gas price. I love this chart. It's actually very wacky. We asked people what was a reasonable gas price and what was an unreasonable gas price. Now, obviously, an economist is going to choose the one, they're going to try to choose something that hurts enough to get people to stop using it. But a politician is absolutely going to freak out with how many people don't like this price. <laughs> so, you know, as we try to use the political system to set prices, to influence people's behavior, we're really caught in this tension between what, what might work and what works politically. And I think one of the things that we really need to do is try to change the conversation away from specifically price and specifically freaking out about high prices. I think we're going to see a lot of high prices in the future. We need to sort of switch away from that to talking about that total cost of transit and how we can bring that down. A lot of the promises that people are making about high price, po political leaders, are falling on deaf ears. Um, we found that uh, over 95% of people said that their elected representatives were doing nothing to deal with their costs of transportation. So uh, very, very high numbers, um, you know, pretty close to unanimous. Um, 
the things that we need to think about going forward, I think, are how do we figure out ways for people to not be helpless? How do we find ways for people to respond to high gas prices, to feel like they're actors in this economy? And I think there's a couple things to think about. Is one is focusing on geographic areas and areas within metropolitan uh, areas that have very high transit costs and figure out things that work for that community. I think the other thing is, is really to focus programs at the middle class and see what they need and see what can be done to change behavior and, and reduce the burden on them. Um, and finally, I, I think we're really just beginning this study and that's part of what this event is about, is kicking this off. But what we want to do is, is really start thinking about this because we're really looking at very high prices in the future or a lot of volatility in the prices. And we need to be prepared because this is really hurting people's families. It's hurting their ability to respond. Um, it's hurting our economy as a whole. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Skip Leitner, who is um, going to present his um, work that he's done on how consumers respond to prices. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. I have the unfortunate uh, pleasure of moving from compelling stories about humanity to the data. Data sometimes can be a four-letter word, and I'm hoping that maybe, if nothing else, we can make this converge with uh, insights that really do support a better way of looking at the uh, problems we face and the opportunities that may be yet ahead. So I'm going to talk about what we refer to as the price-induced energy policy trap or uh, more critically, new observations based on some data that's emerging or some uh, analysis that we've been pulling together. Uh, these are views of my own. They don't represent either uh, the New America Foundation or ACEEE, but rather a study that I've pulled together for this, and hopefully the insights will become a little bit more compelling over time. I thought maybe, what the heck, uh, I'd draw my favorite American philosopher, Gary Larson, from the Far Side uh, cartoon. He's no longer publishing, but here we have a picture of a father lecturing his son who's apparently broken the window with his baseball and the caption reads, eventually Billy came to dread his father's lectures over all other forms of punishment. So uh, as an economist, I hope this isn't a form of punishment for you and the audience there. And we can avoid that particular problem yet today. But let me get the context uh, established to see the numbers in a better way. The U.S. economy is clearly lagging with an anemic growth over the next two years of about 1.7 percent a year. We're used to about a 3 percent growth. Uh, that's what we feel is a, a good, robust level of annual activity in the economy. But the world is moving ahead at over 3 percent a year. So even while we're lagging, the world is moving a little bit bigger than we are. And as a result, we're going to see worldwide demand for oil up, and that's going to drive up, as Lisa has already suggested, prices of gasoline, prices of oil decidedly up. Despite our decline in the use of gasoline, just uh, under 2% a year, we're going to find overall expenditures for gasoline increasing 25%, as Lisa's already alluded to, from $390 billion in 2010 to about $490 billion. I'm using constant dollars here. Now, with consumers' incomes already shrinking in the after effects of the recession, gasoline and their related expenditures, not just gasoline, but everything associated with uh, transportation, will become a huge drag on the economy and slumping gains in energy efficiency will weaken a previously robust economy, we're suggesting, and that in turn also weakens consumer income. So on the one hand, we have expenses that are rising, pulling down the well-being of families, but we have an economy because of huge costs associated with use of gasoline, inefficiencies at all levels, pulling down the income at the same time, rising expenses, diminishing incomes. Key drivers, in quick summary, that impact the U.S. economy, Rising, high and rising in highly volatile gasoline prices, to be sure. That's a, 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 an emerging future for us, no question. But also a form of lock-in, a lock-in of infrastructure, a lock-in of technology, a lock-in of consumer behavior that actually may freeze us into a more costly and less productive pattern of economic activity and overall well-being. And related to the second item above, a lagging improvement in energy efficiency that imposes a huge array of costs that further constrain that more robust economy and therefore constrains consumer incomes. So again, rising expenses, diminished incomes. With this context, we might imagine how policymakers may help us navigate this future. For decades, as Elise has already suggested, we've had what we call a policy by price signal that's been the focus of most attention. That is to say, policymakers have tried to keep prices low by subsidies and then let the market, that is to say those prices, suggest how consumers might change their habits or change their buying patterns or automobiles. 
or we may have, uh, yes, added CAFE standards, CAFE standards to drive up the fuel economy of our, our vehicle fleet, increasing that fuel economy while still allowing the prices to steer us towards the more efficient cars. I have to acknowledge that, yes, CAFE is a critical, a very important uh, start in our overall policy. So driving, if you will, from uh, 27 and a half miles a gallon to over 54 miles a gallon by 2025 is a very big deal. It's important. It must be done. But it's uh, a long-run strategy, and together with the time that it takes for that to kick in, it's insufficient. We need a short-run strategy that addresses total consumer costs, total ownership costs of vehicles, and covers the overall price of transportation, transportation as a family income. To ensure that gasoline prices reflect their full external costs, policymakers will advocate that we, yes, impose new taxes, that we might impose carbon fees and highway user fees. All of this is a price-driven perspective. But this caveat, all strains of the policy assume that consumers can and that they actually do respond to those higher prices in very significant ways and that they reduce the demand in an economically rational fashion. But what Lisa suggested, what the data shows, Yes, the evidence does indicate that consumers can respond to rising prices only in a very limited way, so we're stuck. It becomes a trap, if you will. Higher prices, but no ability to respond to those prices means that you're stuck. So the big conclusion, relying on the price signal to rationally allocate resources to drive us towards a more robust economy is, in fact, a flawed economic and social policy. Indeed, it is possible that a largely price-based policy, paradoxically, may be increasing or at least freezing energy consumption patterns into high levels of inefficiency. This in turn enables the gas pump to capture more of the worker's disposable income even as the continuing inefficiency weakens the size of that income over time. So let's look at some of the indications here. Some of the evidence suggests that we actually had a fairly robust family income in the 50s up through the mid-70s and the economy per capita continued to grow, but median family household income flattened quite a bit. And some of the reasons for that can be talked about a little bit later, but it's clearly evidence that we are slumping as an economy, not providing the well-being. That delta here is significant. Had we grown at the rate of per capita GDP, families would be earning more like about $97,000 as a median household income instead of about $60,000. And you impose on top of that rising prices, you can begin to see the bite that it's taking out of their lives. What's interesting about this chart, we've taken a look at the consumer expenditure allocation for a number of types of purchases that consumers face, whether you're talking about the average consumer, the working poor, or the, uh, the below poverty level, and the highest income. What's really significant is that housing and transportation together on all levels consume over 50% of the household income and obviously much more for the uh, for the working poor so we have uh, excuse me oops we have a problem here with the um, there we go oops the um, <laughs> my apologies Yeah. Trying to go back, or what are you trying to do? Yeah, I'm trying to go back. I jumped the slide inadvertently. Uh, okay. There. Yeah, right. we'll move to there. We're plotting here from 1992 using the e Energy Information Administration short term energy outlook since 1992, a number of variables. We're looking at uh, things like growth in population as well as per capita income. Here, this blue line is the expenditures of gasoline as a, a society, and we've seen almost two doublings since the early 2000s of gasoline expenditures that, that households pay and that businesses pay as well, and the price is significantly jumping. Compared to the income here, we have seen a dramatic increase in the cost of transportation at all levels, and this is imposing serious constraints on overall economic activity, even as population, even as uh, uh, vehicle miles traveled stays relatively flattened. That increases a, a significant problem for the economy to move ahead. And how that looks in terms of what we call elasticities. Elasticities to an economist is nothing more than responsiveness. Given a particular variable like price increase, how does the economy as a whole respond as a percent change? So we have a 10% change in price. 
what's the percent change in uh, driving or percent change in gasoline or energy use. Similarly, if you have a percent change in income, how does that affect overall energy use? So we can see that, interestingly, prices as a short run, within the year that the prices are issued, very little change, so less than 10% change for, say, a 10% uh, 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 increase in income, we see, or, or price rather, we see a 1% change in, in, in gasoline consumption or energy consumption over time. It stays flat. On the other hand, income is driving up the consumption of energy over time. As we have more, we're becoming more locked into the transportation pattern that Lisa talked about, where we have little choice, but we continue that drive towards greater consumption because of having to move further away from the uh, work that, we, uh, that we're able to enjoy, or in terms of the household pattern of, of living, sports and things like that that we're uh, used to consuming or participating in. Looking at transportation, we see a different pattern because we're looking at all expenditures of transportation, not only the gasoline consumption, but also things like insurance, car repairs, uh, all kinds of parking tolls, fees that we have to pay. Interestingly, a much wider gap here so that we see the income elasticity rising a little bit over time, but the price elasticity leaving us relatively unchanged. This suggests a serious lock-in. We have very few choices so that when prices jump, then we're forced to pay uh, those expenditures uh, to the detriment of, of the family income and the larger economy. Here's how we might look at it. If we assume, for example, a, an income elasticity based on the numbers of about 0.5, that is to say, a 10% increase in um, income increases uh, consumption of energy by about 5%, compared to, say, a price elasticity where a 10% increase in price reduces demand by about 1%. What does it have to uh, do to keep us even with re overall gasoline consumption? So on a yearly basis, we might... Oops, there we go again. Uh... All right, so, yeah, I think we can, actually. Looking at the transportation price elasticities by income level, we would expect to see a fairly ordered way of people responding. That is to say, the higher income you have, you'd have one level of response. The lower income you have in a very ordered fashion. Here we have a surprising result here where the working poor, the fourth quintile, has a much different pattern, a, higher, a similar pattern, but much higher uh, elasticity than the first quintile. Now, the first quintile earns probably in the order of about $150,000 a year. The working poor may be $25,000, $35,000 a year, but a very similar pattern, and it's not all following a sequence here. We'd expect to see maybe one, two, three, four, five down like this, but we, instead we see four, one, the average consumer, third, fifth, and second. What's going on here? We can, we can imagine that the working poor respond because they might lose a job, they may lose hours of work, they have, have to affect their commute, so their energy consumption comes down, whereas the fairly well-off family have many more choices, so they can make choices and still maintain the quality of life and therefore reduce their consumption of gasoline, but for entirely different reasons. This tells us that if we want to inform an informed policy, we have to actually match what's going on in people's lives, not assuming that one price meets all expectations or gets the job done. Some very dramatic changes if we look at the uh, breakdown by income. But here's what's interesting from my standpoint as a macroeconomist, how this lock-in continues the inefficiency and constrains overall economic activity in a fairly significant fashion. So I'm looking at this notion we call used energy. Used energy means not the total energy we consume when we drive a car, but the amount of energy in that gallon of gasoline that actually moves the car forward, that actually moves the family from the house to the school. And that amount of energy is hugely wasted, so we have very little actual uh, energy being consumed while a lot of energy being wasted. And this particular chart is showing us from the period 1950 to 1980 where we had a fairly robust economy in the U.S. and we began increasing efficiency over time in such a way as that it allowed the economy to expand by about two and a quarter percent a year as we were improving our efficiency by about one and a half percent a year. That was in the 50 to 1980 range, but look what happened in the 1980 to 2010 range. As we got locked into inefficiency, the lagging efficiency here, we dropped from a full percent of efficiency improvements on an annual basis of the economy-wide productivity, the per capita income, if you will, slumped. You can see that very flat signal over time. 
this greatly diminished overall economic activity. So as expenditures rose, incomes came down, and we felt this particular energy trap. World oil prices really can be the story of uh, the future in many ways, and it's an unfortunate future unless we address it uh, in a fairly aggressive sort of manner. So looking at the cost of oil since 1900, taking a step back in history does sometimes inform, in constant dollars per barrel of oil, we can see two lines here. This is the actual data as published by BP in their statistical report. And we might think that these particular spikes in prices are an anomaly. But when we look at the trend of the future, we see that, in fact, the trend is clearly up, moving over to time uh, to the year 2030, suggesting it's going to do nothing but rise. The interesting part for me is that, indeed, that is what the economists, what the Energy Information Inf Administration is now forecasting to happen, that world oil prices, therefore gasoline prices, are going to rise over time. We're going to be stuck in a rut unless we take steps to address that particular set of problems. Thinking uh, uh, physicist John Wheeler, he's probably the physicist you never heard of. He died recently. Uh, he may be more familiar to you by the question or the phrase he coined, black hole. He asked very big questions. I first came across him in the 70s responding to questions by reporters. How are the heck are you thinking about these new ideas? And his comment was, we shape the world by the questions we ask. So I want to ask a different question about how the opportunity might look if we really got serious and really began to promote efficiency and help people break out of that energy trap by giving them the means to respond to these prices. So my friends, the economists in, typically, uh, fashion, in typical fashion in 1980 looked at how the U.S. was using energy, and we were looking at about 80 quads of energy. The amount doesn't matter, but here's where we were. And they were saying we're going to maintain an aggressive economy and we're going to grow the energy requirements up to about 150 quads by the year 2000 in order to maintain a robust economy. But we had a number of people saying, well, we could look at it differently. A 1980 report by DOE looked at two dozen studies, said we could imagine an economy that used a lot less energy and still maintained a level of robustness. At the same time, look what really happened. It turns out that the historic use of energy followed not the economists' look at the future, but because we did respond to things like prices with different legislative policies, different standards, different kinds of uh, programs and policies in a wide array, our overall use actually followed what we then in 1980 thought was a low energy future. But now we're beginning to return to a future that says we have to begin increasing energy use again as if energy consumption is an inevitable way of life instead of realizing that we could reduce demand by new smart infrastructure, providing better transportation facilities, new materials, more innovative behaviors, all catalyzed by smart policies and investments. So our ultimate efficiency resource I'm going to go back to Lisa, a, a blog that she posted not too long ago. I think this nails it exactly right. Usually when we talk about addressing big problems like oil dependence, climate change, and stagnant wages, we talk about the big fix. High-speed rail, electric cars, climate change bills. We don't talk about the little personal things like auto loans and the total cost of automobile ownership. We should. The auto's all-consuming role in our lives, given an extraordinary leverage, either to weaken or to strengthen both the economy and the environment. That's a critical perspective. We need to address the total deal, not just simply the price of energy. And if, for those of you interested, uh, you can go to her website uh, and check out that particular blog. But the need, therefore, becomes simple. For policies that do more than merely signal the need to act, in other words, economists say provide the right signals, consumers will act, we also need policies that enable people, households, families, and even businesses to be able to act policies that reflect their specific income needs and that give them both the information and the opportunity to positively make a difference in their lives and that by doing so enable our economy to move, move forward. Or again, Gary Larson, a couple of spiders on a playground uh, in the back of the school there, woven a web across the bottom of the slide. If we pull this off, we'll eat like kings. <laughs> or more formerly, as Maynard Keynes said in the forward to his book, The General Theory, the difficulty lies not with the new ideas but in escaping the old ones. And with that, uh, I'm happy to turn the podium back over, Lisa. Thank you, Skip. Um, what we'd like to do now is uh, have uh, Jared Bernstein come up and respond to that, and then we'll take questions. And, and what we'd really like is for you all to um, you know, see this as a chance for a, a discussion. Um, but first, we're going to have our chief discussant, Jared Bernstein. I'll stand here. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Lisa uh, and Skip. Um, hmm. 
Oh, that's that. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me start out by saying how much I really like this project. Uh, I don't know if, for those of you who are uh, at all familiar with my work, I, I um, very much uh, try to get uh, out of the uh, kind of traditional boxes that um, uh, economic analysis uh, usually starts from. And uh, I think uh, Lisa and Skip have done uh, precisely that uh, uh, with the project. In fact, my comments are kind of uh, uh, uncharacteristically going to go back the other way, get us kind of a little bit back inside, inside that box. Um, and I want to pose just a couple of basic questions about, about the research. Uh, but um, I do want to begin by saying um, I very much <laughs> uh, agree with and endorse uh, the themes that, that you've heard so far. Um, I think the energy trap is real. I think it is taxing the middle class. And I think it's posing obvious challenges for uh, our, uh, not just our economy, but the environment that we're going to leave to uh, our kids. Um, the first issue I want to raise and talk most about in, in my, in my uh, comments is a fundamental question that I had reading all this material and listening to uh, Lisa and Skip's excellent presentation with all those amazing graphics. I particularly like the little bubbles that went up and down. That was, that reminded me of, you know, drinking champagne or something. Um, yeah, it's not as clear to me as it should be. So, so these are some I don't know, critical comments, basically asking a, a big question that I'd love you to deal more with in your work going forward. It's not, I'm not, it's not clear enough to me where the market isn't working here. I'm not convinced, and I see market failures around every corner, uh, I'm not convinced uh, enough that the market and consumer preferences, that kind of intersection, is as uh, dysfunctional as you think. Um, I see in much of what you're describing and writing about um, consumer sovereignty. Uh, consumers doing what they want to do and sometimes spending a lot of, uh, of their hard-earned money uh, to do so, perhaps too much as a share of their income based on what's left over. But, and again, I'm being a very square, regular economist here, which is not a hat I usually put on, but, but uh, I think it's a useful one. Um, the, there, there's a, a, an interesting finding that somebody once came up with um, uh, comparing the way people think about um, their relationship to each other in, U in the U.S. versus Europe. First of all, the U.S. has a lot more physical space, of course, than Europe, and uh, some of their, uh, while our cities can be very crowded, uh, obviously uh, uh, they're, um, uh, they tend to be more so over there. And someone went uh, and looked at, mu walked around museums and found that in Europe, people are just more comfortable being close, physically closer to each other than they are in the U.S. In the U.S., we like more distance between each other. We, if you put a meter on someone and you just have them get close to another person, the meter goes a little bit more into the red here in the U.S. than it does in Europe. Um, and, uh, uh, it, it, and, and there's a, an amazing, th you know, there's a really interesting thing that happens here. It doesn't, you don't see it as much in other advanced economies where we get into our cars by ourselves, not everybody, but a lot of, uh, we get into our car, if we can afford to, we get into our cars by ourselves and we commute to work. I mean, I do it myself uh, and so sit there in the car, uh, stuck in traffic, while on the other side of the road, uh, you know, there's just nothing happening and you know, taking a very long time to get into work, sometimes clenching one's teeth with all the traffic and the uh, uh, dysfunction, but then getting in the car and doing it again the next day. It, it, if, if, it's, if it's true that um, we are reveal, if it's true that we're essentially revealing our preferences by putting ourselves through this expensive time uh, uh, wasting a uh, process, um, then um, the lift here for uh, Lisa and Skip and the Energy Trap, Trap Project is really heavy. You're not just pushing against um, price fundamentals, you're pus pushing against uh, the revealed preferences of people who view driving in their car, you know, by themselves, even long distances, as um, if not part of the American dream, kind of a reward for getting where they're going, getting where they want to go. Now that 
uh, flies in the face of some of the things that Lisa found in the survey. So I, I, I want to be fair in my presentation. Uh, people, if people truly say, well, you know, driving's a necessary evil, that, that's different. That, that suggests that, you know, you'd rather not, but it's necessary. So if I had choices to do otherwise, I would, I would undertake those choices. Um, Lisa also said people are ready for change, and I think that may be true. There does get to be a point where uh, the ridiculousness and, 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 and the waste is, is just, uh, uh, and the cost is too high. But a lot of what I saw in the presentation, particularly in some of uh, Skip's data, um, uh, you know, I think does support this hypothesis that people are doing what they want to do. Um, the fact that the price elasticity is so flat, uh, um, the fact that people don't, you know, I, I, I still, again, I'm, I'm probably enough of an economist to think that generally people kind of respond to prices in fairly uh, predictable ways, uh, generally. And the fact that the, the price elasticity is, fl uh, is, is flat has always been taken to suggest that, um, uh, again, people are, are uh, responding to price increases um, um, uh, by, uh, by just buying more gas, not changing their behavior that much because uh, uh, they, they want to drive around in their cars. And I thought the quintile results sort of suggested that, that finding as well. Um, so that, that to me is a conventional economist kind of interpretation of, of what we've seen in a fundamental challenge to the project, which is it, it, despite the fact that some people call this a necessary evil, I don't see enough evidence to lead me to believe that people want to get out of the trap because I don't know that they feel like they're in a trap. So now let me say a bunch of reasons why I think what all I just said is maybe wrong. Um, uh, first of all, and Skip made this point, he's 100% right, uh, you know, the price doesn't reflect the cost. <laughs> it doesn't reflect the social cost, uh, certainly in an environmental sense. So it's, you know, you mentioned the subsidy in, in gas. One of the things we talk about around here uh, in D.C. is uh, the uh, uh, something like 50 billion over 10 year subsidies that we give to our uh, oil and gas producers. So you know right there that uh, uh, the, the, the cost is uh, is, is low um, and subsidized. Certainly the price of gas is a lot more, is a lot lower here than it is in Europe. Uh, that has a lot to do with taxation. Um, so if the price isn't reflecting the social cost, then my theory that people are kind of responding to prices rationally kind of is a, a little bit tweaked because they're not facing the true cost of their behavior. Um, housing is just not close enough, affordable housing is just not close enough to work. This I know to be a fact. I've, I've done this research myself, but it's kind of obvious if you think about it, that affordable housing not being near work makes this idea that people are revealing their preferences a little bit suspect. If you simply can't afford to live near where you work, that, uh, that, that's an area where the market's not working. Oh, let me be very clear that, you know, my first set of comments are, gee, it looks to me like a market is working here and we're looking at revealed preferences. My second set of comments are, where is the market not working? So it's not working and the prices don't reflect the social cost. Housing isn't near, near work. Inadequate mass transit. Um, I live in Alexandria. We happen to be one of the richest cities in the country and the world. And I can't get home using mass transit after about 7.20 at night which is an amazing thing. And, and, you know, because I have this job that sometimes requires long and odd hours, um, I often can't avail myself of mass transit. So that's pretty amazing when you think of it. This is, this is the you know, capital of the largest economy in, 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 in the world, and we have inadequate mass transit. Um, so that's another way, I think, in which we can't really just say, well, people are revealing their preferences. I think, I think that's a really key find. I, I mean, to me, if I were going to kind of just wave my wand and get one solution out of the en energy trap, it would be adequate mass transit. And I'll say a little bit more about that in my concluding comments. Credit constraints. Um, uh, and, inf uh, and I want a combination of credit constraints and information problems uh, uh, um, uh, around auto purchases. I thought Lisa's data on this was quite compelling. Um, uh, people don't necessarily have the information they need to know about uh, um, 
uh, fuel, the, the fuel efficiency and the, how much it will cost them over the course of the year. I thought some of those numbers were quite dramatic in terms of low-income people spending a lot more on transportation. And one of the things you see is a very elastic, I thought we saw this in some of the data, a very elastic response to um, prices uh, of gas in, 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 in car ownership. Um, people, when gas prices go down, all of a sudden people are out there buying SUVs. And I would consider that to be pretty much an information problem. I think if you were able to explain to someone that it's very likely that this is a tick down and it's going to tick back up and you're going to be stuck with this SUV. I thought it was interesting for the guy who wanted to sell it two days later. Um, uh, so I think there's information problems and credit problems. Um, so, you know, there are obvious ways, I think, in which the market isn't working. So on one hand, I feel like the project needs to deal um, a lot more with this fundamental point that I do fear that people are revealing their preferences in a way that Skip, me, and Lisa might not love, but in a way that which is real. On the other hand, um, some of those preferences are distorted by bad price signals, housing in inconvenient locations, inadequate mass transit. Let me just finish with uh, uh, kind of combining some of these comments, uh, particularly in, in the area of mass transit. I actually believe that um, if people had uh, that I actually believe that, that both of what I said is true. The market is working better than probably Lisa and Skip think it is, um, and it's also broken in ways exactly like Lisa and Skip think it is. And ergo, the solution should combine the two. Just fantasize uh, for a second here that you could walk outside of your house and get into a compartment, and that that compartment would be yours alone, and you could smoke your cigarettes or sing songs to yourself or do whatever you like to do in your car because we Americans like to drive to work by ourselves too much. Um, and that compartment could take you right to work. And you get out of that compartment and you'd be at work. You wouldn't have to worry about parking. You'd certainly be paying something. I mean, this is not, there's no free lunch. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, you'd, uh, certainly societies, uh, um, uh, certainly you'd have taxes and user fees, whatever. But you wouldn't have a car and you wouldn't have gas and you wouldn't have... Um, uh, uh, parking expenses, and you wouldn't spend all that time in traffic. Well, you know, that's a fantasy. But it is conceivable uh, that uh, one could craft a mass transit system, uh, or perhaps, as Lisa suggested, um, employers could uh, engage more in employer-centered transit. Um, that began to get you closer to that role. Maybe it's vans, as Lisa mentioned, that, uh, uh, of course, you're sitting in a van with a bunch of other people, and, you know, they, according to her research, actually, folks, after a couple of weeks, got more used to that. So, but, but the idea is to, build, is to take both of these factors, revealed preferences and market failure, put them together, and think about a mass transit system that provides a kind of a more personalized service um, uh, and uh, 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 connects people uh, with work uh, more uh, effectively um, and gets them, uh, yet at the same time, gets them out of their cars and diminishes their dependence on, on gas. I'll stop there, but thanks very much. Should we sit up here? We should. Um, do you have? Do you wish to discuss anything? Well, yeah, I want to pick up one point Jared uh, made, and I think he's right on with regard to whether price reveals preferences or not. I, if we look at it as the data, we might conclude that. But increasing number of studies suggesting that, as Americans, we actually don't like to commute all that much, and I'm wondering if the response doesn't actually reveal our constraints, or our lack of opportunity. And if we begin looking at it from the human perspective, very much in the way that, Lisa, you presented some of those early stories, the energy trap stories, looking at it as the problems consumers actually face, our households or families are actually confronted with, it really is a revealing of their lack of choice and their lack of alternatives. Uh, Tammy, I remember, you said she spent $25,000 for a car that cost her $9,000. She spent like $3,000 a year on gasoline. $3,000 a year in repairs, all that siphoned money out of her wallet, so she had no other choice until she had a helping hand, which is getting to Jared's point, how is the market broken? It took a helping hand, somebody not to 
really address their gasoline problem, but their total lifestyle. So she had counseling to help work through the credit problems, to learn how to manage, to learn how to make different choices, and then be able to borrow money for a new car where the repair costs are lower, where the transportation costs are much lower, and she's able to afford it with maybe, a, a, I think it was a 35 or 4 percent interest loan in that particular example. So it's a need to address the complete problem, not just a piece of the problem. I, I think what's interesting about um, Tammy is that she actually, when she was purchasing the new car, was not given the option of buying the standard car in New Hampshire, which is not a Yaris. It's, a, it's something big that's not going to slide so much on the ice. Um, I actually should check in with her in January to see how she <laughs> feels about this. But, um, but what I think is, is significant is that her, actually her choices were limited in what she could buy. They, it, the terms of the loan said, we're not going to lend you money unless we know that your total cost of transit is going to be within your means. Um, and that's actually not the way the traditional auto loan works. The traditional auto loan is we're going to get, you know, the maximum from you that we can, given your ability to negotiate in the credit market. It doesn't actually combine the total cost of the gasoline into the into the um, future. I, I really um, I I'm very intrigued by Jared's comment about sort of taking these the two notions of the um, consumer preference and. Um, uh, and consumer constraints and trying to combine them as we think about mass transit or as we think about other solutions for getting people out of their cars if they, if they want to get out of their cars. Um, one thing, I, I, I spent some time in New York riding around with the dollar vans. Uh, they, these are about 850 vans that uh, drive around Brooklyn and Queens and give people rides for a dollar or two apiece. It turns out to be the nation's 20th largest bus service. It moves 120,000 people a day, <laughs> and it's entirely for profit and, and presumably profitable, although uh, I didn't get into the finances of the individual vans. What's interesting about it is that they provide services for people that they can't get from a bus. So, for example, the, um, their cars will... I mean, their vans will take a, pick up a parent and take the parent and the child to daycare, let the parent walk up to the door and bring the child in, which obviously in New York you want to bring your kid right into that door, turn them over, and then go back, get back in the car, uh, which is pretty incredible. Um, and you could imagine that working in other, other locations. You could imagine people in smaller rural communities who have a large network of friends or a large network of relatives. I, I come from Maine, where there are towns that where everyone is a Cookson or everyone is a, um, a Pinkham. Um, and, uh, and, and there are certain people who have massive numbers of connections who could actually figure out how to get those people back and forth um, and, and make a, a, a job on the side. What I think is kind of cool about the um, van program in New York, um, one, one barrier to it is it's somewhat illegal. But one of the positive things about it is that it's counter-cyclical with the economy because it's like Avon, it's like those sort of entrepreneurial things where people with connections get bumped out of the, the regular economy and they go into working their connections and, and driving a van. So the worse the economy is, the more vans there are on the road, which means the more transit options there are for people. And that's um, actually runs counter to the way that we behave around mass transit. So I think thinking kind of in made, really wild ways. That, that sort of underscores my point, I think, right? Like people, the economy gets better, they get out of the vans. You know, I'm, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it does kind of point in that direction. No, that's true. Or the van drivers stop driving. <laughs> hmm. um, anyway, uh, I would like to, did you have a response to? No, I, 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 uh, I think both of, uh, I think what you both said is exactly right. And I really do believe that the answer lies in the intersection of, of the two sides that I tried to present. Um, and I think we'd like to open the floor up to questions now. But, um, be sure to get the microphone first. Thank yes. you. Um, I wanted to uh, take issue with a concern about pay as you drive insurance mm -hmm. and more generally the whole strategy about taking fixed driving costs and making them variable, which is different than rising gas prices, which is increasing overall the cost people are paying for transportation. Brookings did a fairly major study um, a couple of years ago, and the average household, the average vehicle insurance costs would go down with pay-as-you-drive insurance by $270. You're already showing in your, with your working poor, which is the 
group you indicated some of the most concern about and some of your examples were from, in fact, that group. They, sh they were shown to be the most price elastic in Skip's mm -hmm. um, chart. So they are very responsive. What they're doing is they're getting rid of discretionary trips. Um, they're taking absolutely the most important trips. But they're not saving an insurance. And they could. Um, you're not having a case where rural drivers are would automatically be paying more. Quite the contrary. The zip code ratings that insurance companies do now, they are not losing money anywhere. They're not losing money in the rural areas. Uh, there's a lower per mile cost because a lot of that travel is freeway travel, which is relatively safer on a per mile basis than other travel. But the idea of uh, offering that kind of savings is tremendous. And I would, I would pose to you the following. If, the, if we had pay-as-you-drive insurance sort of universally adopted here, and somebody came to you and said, I have a better idea, let's get rid of that, and the consequences of that would be that we are going to raise, on average, the insurance cost for people by $270 per vehicle, we would be rightly screaming that it's a terrible policy. And so I think the goal should be to try to make that happen. I really appreciate your comments. I've always been a huge fan of pay-as-you-drive insurance. And I think what struck me was the optics for the middle class, people who feel that they are forced to drive a really long way. Um, and do, I, I think there's an interesting issue here which Jared's comments bring up and which Skip's data brings up is to what extent are people not seeing their choices and to what extent are people not able to choose choices. And I think that the, the issue of pay-as-you-drive insurance is very important because it's actually, it's a way of giving people a very explicit signal about the costs of extra driving. Um, and it's a way of kind of quantifying that. Um, the, the issue is, is that if people perceive it to be punishing them for things that they already can't change, um, it, it, it needs to be articulated to people perhaps in a different way. And I, I, I have to say I was, quite shocked when I received the email, I think it was yesterday, about pay-as-you-drive insurance being punishment for this middle-class person um, who couldn't change her, her, uh, her driving. And uh, it, it struck me as, as just odd and something that I hadn't really thought about from that perspective because I'd always seen it as, you know, if you can drive less, then you'll, be, you'll benefit tremendously because we're all sort of paying for the high-level drivers. Um, so part of this, I think, is figuring out a better uh, education package. And one of the, the you know, there's a, a little lump in Skip's data mm -hmm. on elasticity uh, after um, the Iranian oil crisis. The people did reduce driving dramatically. We reduced gasoline consumption by 12 percent. Um, we also uh, integrated cafe standards, and, and prices were quite high for a while. But what's interesting is... Um, the, the political establishment really reacted to that and said, we have high prices, they might be here to stay, we have the moral equivalent of war, we're gonna put on cardigans. President Nixon back in 1973 unplugged the White House Christmas tree, which is like a really a, a major bummer of a move, um, and, and probably didn't do him any good, but it really sent a powerful signal. And this time when we have high prices, what we have is the political system is saying, oh, they'll be back down soon. This is the result of conspiracy. This is the result of this. Um, and I, I think that as, as we move, there, there's really no question that we have to make the price of fuel and the price of highway driving more accurately reflect its costs. But the problem is, is if we move in that direction without giving people the sense of options and actual options, I think we end up punishing certain people. And I, I really fear for these people, the Tammies, um, the people, the, the Darrens, the people at this who, who really cannot move economically. I should, um, can I make one quick comment on this very quick? Uh, um, is, uh, uh, I, I, you sound like you know uh, more about this drive by the mile than I do. Um, I, I, what, what I, I find very unsettling, because uh, uh, 20 years ago, my colleague Dean Baker, I was working at the Economic Policy Institute, um, was pushing this idea. And we had a, uh, a, a conference here in DC on it. And, Every, you know, a lot of people thought it was just made sense. I can't, uh, is there any insurance company that offers that? I mean, if there is, so, okay, so it seems like that would be worth looking at, uh, its impact, both in the 
positive attributes that you mentioned and I did, and, and also this punishing point that Lisa makes that I think is, is relevant. Um, I, I really would like, I, it's kind of a head scratch to me why it's not much more widely available. Uh, I don't know that I know the answer. Give one minute, just, just on, on that, just for background. Uh, companies are using data and pricing based on it. Progressive is the leader with a product called Snapshot. Unfortunately, the, the, they're not sort of communicating to you what the details are in yeah, terms that's what of I'm how you're... I'm saying as right. a shopper for insurance, I'd like to be able to go out and say, here is an option for they'll, you. They'll put something in your car, they'll, they'll calculate a rate they won't tell you about. The, the real key from a behavioral economics standpoint in trying to get people to reduce their driving is to make sure that the, the relationship is salient, you know what you're doing, the, the incentive is continuous, right. and so on and so forth. Yeah. The, the other thing I like about some of Progressive's um, experiments was that there was one to have a device in the car that would measure how fast you went. So if you were driving in the most fuel efficient zone of 55 or so, you were uh, rewarded for that as well because you were and if you're safer. texting while you're driving, it's gonna make, <laughs> should make your rate go up. Hand comes from the ceiling. Yeah, if I might just summarize, because I think Lisa captured eloquently. Um, there's three elements, uh, quite apart from the pay as you drive, which I also endorse as a concept. The one is consumers not seeing the full array of their choices or yeah. seeing the full impact in their lives by the choices they make. That's one thing that needs to be done, so the optics matter. The second is not being able to make the choices. You may be able to see opportunities, but if you have high interest rates or you're locked in in many other ways, you might not be able to make those choices. So having the market really in a number of dimensions make those choices easier to pursue. And then finally, it's got to be a complete package. It can't be just pay as you drive, but it's got to be an amalgam of things that bring the cost down and that promote the larger efficiencies to the well-being of both the household and, and the economy. Let's take more questions. Yeah. Um, yes, over here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the pay-as-you-drive, I think, is part of a, a bigger um, cross-subsidy issue as well. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious of what your opinions are on how much can or should energy policy correct inequalities that are already existing. So, for example, with the pay-as-you-drive, I, mean, I, I guess I'm willing to pay a little more to cross-subsidize people who really need you know, that, that, that subsidy, but not people who you know, are just driving for fun and have you know, disposable income. But I would also be willing to pay more taxes for the same purpose. So, how 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 do you square There's kind some of other one percent? <laughs> 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 um, so so just how, how do you square what energy policy can do to correct inequalities, and how much should it do? Well, I might just comment that given the huge array of costs already imposed in the economy, if we can move in a direction that reduces those costs substantially, we have much more wiggle room to correct some of these uh, inequities at different levels. And that's part of the happy solution to the extent that we have uh, more efficient cars on the one hand, to the extent we have pay-as-you-drive that spreads the insurance out over a number of, in fact, the entire driving population, to the extent that we have low interest loans made available to consumers, we then are able to address a lot of these inequities in a much smarter fashion, but that also improves the robustness of the economy. So to that extent, I think we have uh, nowhere to go but up in that regard. So I think we can have the best of the, both worlds. We can improve the overall costs and correct some of the inequities that are confronted by consumers who are otherwise stuck. I don't have a great answer <laughs> to that very good question, um, and it's one that I struggle with. Um, I recently did an entry on, um, I have a blog, I recently did an entry on my blog and I was talking about how, uh, in fact, if you look at gas prices over the last uh, six months or so, they've come down by around 30 cents and if you kind of take the economist rule of thumb that the every every cent of, of gas prices is, is, is uh, up or down about a billion dollars uh, multiplied across the economy, um, in thinking in terms of the current economy and, and our, all the slack therein, you know, I was talking about this as a stimulus um, in the sense that people now have, you know, 30 billion dollars more disposable income. And in the same, and then, and then I said a paragraph of much more in, in the context of what we're talking about today about, you know, is this a good thing? It uh, you know, essentially means that um, 
uh, uh, folks are back to back to driving more. And if you kind of follow that through, you get right to what I think is a pretty conservative ideology. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's it's one that's uh, quite dominant uh, in this town. That um, you know our goal should be to diminish the cost of, for, uh, of fossil fuels so that people have you know more disposable income. Drill, drill, drill. Um, uh, and. Uh, and, and so uh, one of the things that happens when you start getting into measures that I think are very important, uh, a price on carbon, for example, is you have CBO studies that say here are the distributional impacts. It's getting to your question. Here are the distributional impacts, and they really take a whack out of those who are uh, at the bottom of, of, of the income scale um, uh, and less uh, have less ability to uh, escape uh, the incidence of the, of the tax, and so you start. The, and so the, the the liberals, the progressives in the carbon tax debate, talk about taking some of the income from the carbon tax and rebating it to lower income people to to off, offset that. And now now you're into pretty a pretty complex thing. I mean, in, in some ways, you're dampening the very price signal you're trying to create by giving people a rebate to offset the higher prices. So um, I, I think um, I think it's 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 a it's a very tricky thing, and I think the way around it, again, is 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 uh, uh, very robust investments in adequate mass transit, I, I, and that 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 are paid for by uh, in part by uh, a taxation on on fossil fuels. Uh, I, to me, that that kind of squares the circle uh, and solves uh, uh, the problem that I that I just raised. I think this is maybe one of the places where we disagree to a certain extent. Um, I, I think that one of the issues as we put more prices into, uh, more costs into the price of fuel is that we really need to address the financial impediments to change. And that means a um, very robust financing program to, uh, that steers people pretty clearly uh, towards more efficient vehicles. Um, I also think that as we see uh, a large number of, of electric and hybrid vehicles coming into the market, we're sort of moving towards a, a, a two-tier system in which the people who have money can move away, as gas prices rise, they can move away to a radically different consumption level, and the people who don't are, are pretty much stuck behind, and we have this kind of you know, s segmenting of reaction. Um, I also want to pose kind of a question, which is that um, over the last year, we've, the, the Obama administration has tried to deal with high gas prices in a couple of different ways. One of the most striking, I think, was the use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and trying to use that with international petroleum reserves to try to give a signal back to the market. Um, one of the unex completely unexplored areas uh, for policy is what if you got consumers to respond more? What if you were saving the money and uh, at the same time that you were sending the signal to the market. Um, one question we didn't really ask in this, in these, uh, in, in Skip's um, data, is how much is consumers' sort of numbness to prices actually involved in the upward trend of prices? You know, if we could sort of build in reaction from consumers, would we be able to moderate these world oil prices a little bit? I don't know. Um, it's but I think it's worth exploring. I think it's also worth exploring for different metropolitan areas to think about kind of um, teaching people to be more elastic, teaching people to reduce their spending when prices are high because it will preserve those families' ability to spend locally. Um, and it also gives people, um, it gives people a feeling of efficacy, basically. It, feels, it makes them, this whole thing that people say again and again, if gas prices go up, I've got to pay it. The, the first the first guy in the, um, the the first guy in this presentation or the second guy is a guy named Brent who says something to the effect of they've got us by the gonads and you know that is really uh, there is a strong people have a strong personalized feeling towards the gas prices I think that on a local level and and at a broader financial level we can actually give people the tools to respond and we might actually see very dramatic changes in uh, in prices as well. Um, are there other questions? Yes, uh, the guy in the back. I sort of changing the subject a little. I'm, I'm very interested in this chart about world oil prices because it, where, where we have this huge spike in the 70s and then we have this huge spike in the, la in, in the last decade. 
And then we had steadily declining prices in between for close to 20 years. And it was a time of rapid economic growth, relatively speaking. And in fact, the last decade was an area of slow growth. So, and I, and I, you know, I'm old enough to go back to the early 1980s in the wake of the oil shocks of the 1970s. And I suspect if you looked at EIA reports back in that era, they would have projected, as you are doing now, this continued because of global demand, uh, increase in prices into the future. And of course, that proved to be absolutely wrong. Uh, it's not that I believe in drill, drill, drill. The question I want to ask is, Industrial structure has something to do with all this. The structure of the oil industry, the amount of oil that's out there and recoverable at near term, you know, forget about the long trend, in the short and medium term. The oil industry, in my lifetime's experience, is a manipulated market in which you have cartels that control price behavior and can exercise their cartel power in order to lower prices, in order to achieve political and other uh, things. And so I'm questioning about, uh, the, my, the, as I listen to all of this, we have these goals that we have, whether it be you know, efficiency, getting more income into people's hands, uh, you know, getting people out of their hour-long commutes, putting less carbon in the air. You take all of that, becoming a more efficient economy, and you have this other thing out there, which is, is that all of those policies, trying to manipulate them, can be undermined by this industrial structure that we have in energy markets. So I'm curious about what policies you think need to be taken there in order to achieve any of the other goals that you'd like to achieve. Well, I might open up that thought by recalling that I took a look all the way back to 1900 for the long-term pattern for precisely reasons you raised. That is to say, in 73, 74, with the embargo at that time, or the Iranian shutoff in 1979, or more recently, we saw, you're exactly right, a lot of political manipulation, a lot of uh, market play that drove up the prices. Uh, some of it had to do with uh, constraints, a lot of uncertainty that drove up the prices. But overall, the trend is pretty clear when we look at that 1900 to the current day view, and we're seeing increasingly harder resources to tap into. Colleagues at uh, Boston University uh, Cutler, Cleveland, and others are suggesting that in 1900, for example, when we used a barrel of oil to produce more oil, we got about 100 barrels of oil out of the ground. In other words, the energy return on energy. At about 1950 to 1970, that began diminishing so that we were looking maybe more like 45 barrels, 50 barrels of oil returned for a barrel of oil invested in the production of, of that petroleum. And then more recently, we're not starting to see returns of maybe marginal units, uh, eight to 10 barrels of oil per barrel invested. So it's getting harder and harder to produce, even as the demand is going up and as the refiner's capacity is flatlined or the ability to uh, explore and produce more oil is flatlined compared to the demand, there's nowhere to go but up. It may not be as dramatic. Uh, depending, but it could be, and that's why I think you're seeing our colleagues at the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, suggesting we will see in real dollars an increase in oil prices. Obviously, the way to deal with that relates exactly to your question, which is the industrial structure that is twofold. One is the composition of the economy and how it uses energy, and then the second is what is the efficiency with which we pull that energy into our economic process, and both of those need to be addressed, and that's the way forward. Uh, the third might be then uh, alternatives to the petroleum. Uh, both, all three of those then can begin to push down and moderate the price over the long haul to the benefit not only of families but the, the larger economy as well. Um, that's Merrill, isn't it? Yeah, how you doing? Uh, I, uh, I have only a, a small point to add. I, I think that the premise of your question is, is, is correct and that there are um, large competitive inefficiencies associated with the political power of this uh, industry. And uh, there are a couple of ideas that I think are on the table that can help. The one I like the most is clean energy standards. This is where states uh, require that by X year, 20% uh, of, uh, of the energy produced by our utilities has to come from clean energy. Uh, California has been a leader in this, and has and, and, and it's turned out that uh, uh, at least as I understand it, you may others may have uh, different information, that it's actually been um, pretty effective in in um, generating uh, more activity in clean energy and aligning uh, the prices 
basically rising the prices of fossil fuel relative to those of, of cleaner energy, of renewables. Um, and I think there's pretty much a parity now in, uh, in California in terms of uh, energy production of, of uh, fossil and renewable. And, and uh, uh, various um, uh, uh, states have been talking about imposing these, uh, these energy standards. Uh, I think they make a lot of sense in the same way I like the, uh, the CAFE requirements. I agree with Skip's point in his footnote where he says, you know, this is, this is a longer term solution. But I think that those kinds of things put competitive pressures on the fossil fuel industry that are currently lacking. Okay. Yeah, we have we have to end in uh, about a minute because of C-SPAN. Uh, I need to ask if there are any other questions. Yes. I'll make it very quick. Uh, I'd like to suggest that it isn't the differential cost of living in the suburbs versus the cities <coughs> that causes people to move to the suburbs. It seems to me that especially when you add in the commuting costs of living in the suburbs, the differential, perhaps, is in favor of living in the cities. And most people, I think, move to the suburbs when they start to raise a family and have to think about the educational systems in the suburbs compared to the city schools. So it seems to me that quite apart from this fast, really very <laughs> excellent discussion of prices of gas versus uh, types of cars and amount of commuting, it seems to me, and this is beyond what your data has talked about, that increasing the educational cities' uh, opportunities and levels would keep many more families in the cities in, and cutting out all these long costs and have them more time to be together also without the long commuting. Right. I, I think that's actually a wonderful point to end on in, in that that what starts off as a discussion of gasoline, um, when you really broaden it out, becomes very deeply existential. This is partly about the kids, and, uh, and part of the reason that people move is for the education system. Um, and uh, it's also um, part of why they will live quite far from their job, because they're looking for something for their kids. Um, the same thing happens, uh, it, but basically, I think the underlying thing is that we use gasoline to overcome other sorts of barriers in our system. And those overcome the lack of credit. We, we drive further to overcome lack of credit. We drive further to deal with um, different sorts of school systems. Um, we also end up with uh, home health care workers driving further to take care of people. Uh, and, and gasoline has always been, as you mentioned, it, you know, for 20 years it was relatively cheap. It has been the elasticity in the system that allowed us to get things done even as, as, as things were getting kind of out of control. And what we really need to start doing is figuring out how to put the elasticity back in the elasticity, I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> which is a good enough way to end this whole conversation. Thank you very much. If you have thoughts about where this research uh, should go, please come and talk to me or, or contact me by email. Um, I really see this as an ongoing conversation, an ongoing project to, to look at this issue. Thank you. And thank you very much to, to Jared and to Skip. Um, this was a really interesting 